You're about to join Jerry Parker, Marit Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Moritz Siebert and I, Niels Kastrolasen, where each week we take the pulse of the global market through the lens of a rules-based investor. And for those of you who are regular listeners, our conversations are really intended to keep you focused and inspired to continue your rules-based investing journey. And if you're new to the show, we hope that today's episode will trigger some curiosity to check out the back catalog and listen to the past episodes that you may have missed, like last week's episode with Rob Carver, where we took a deep dive into some really interesting topics and, of course, also did a roundup of the year 2020 and how Rob's trend-following models had experienced the year. Moritz, great to be back with you in the new year. How are you doing? How are things where you are? Good. Everything's fine. And hi, Niels, by the way. It's snowing here, uh, south of Munich. Winter wonderland. Everything's white. Looking forward to some skiing later on this afternoon, cross-country skiing, that is. There's really nothing else that's uh, possible to do here. But um, great weather in the middle of winter and uh, great start to the year as well, trading-wise. Yes, we'll definitely dig into that. I think we have to make the most of the opportunity to talk about trend on a on a strong note. But before we do that, let me try and wrap up the week. You know, despite the bears enjoying a rare day in the sun on Friday, it wasn't really the financial markets that saw most of the uh, action this week, but rather the grain sector where a massive bull market that started last summer continued. And I remember Moritz and I certainly discussing that back in, I think, August, September, when we saw the first breakouts occur and where many of these markets actually now have seen in excess of 50 or even 75% increase from their lows. But if we just focus on the US stock market for a moment, because we are heading into a week where we're going to have a new president, a new administration. And even though the realized volatility of the S&P during the week wasn't that excessive, it was a relatively hectic week. I mean, the overshadowing events of the week were the announcement by the U.S. House of Representatives, of course, to impeach Trump again for the second time, and also the upcoming stimulus package by the new Biden administration. And while it seemed that market had been longing for a large stimulus uh, package. The announcement as such really had less effect than that one could even anticipate. And I think the S&P substantially really fell a little bit to close the week uh, down about 1.5% as far as I remember. On the other hand, the overall sentiment seems to continue to be quite euphoric. So let me get into that a little bit. So the euphoric can easiest, I would say, be seen by looking at the options market, both on individual stocks, but also on the index level. And while options always have been used both as a method of insurance, buying protection, but also speculation as a kind of a leverage one-sided bet, historically, especially on the index level, the main use was for downside protection, or at least trading in puts, which include premium income strategies as well, of course. But in recent times, it seems that upside speculation is the main trade to be in. And while trading in calls options might also include some income generating strategies, selling calls, it is currently dominated by the desire for this upside speculation. And I couldn't help notice that the put call ratio is currently around 0.4 on single equities which is around the lowest readings ever recorded on kind of a longer term picture. And of course, given the proximity of retail investors to focus on single stock names rather than indices, one could argue that it highlights the current market trends and, and forces. But despite all of that, the, the index of fear, the VIX, um, actually remained pretty unchanged for the week. Although we did see the term structure shift upwards almost in parallel fashion. And maybe, I guess, that was probably mostly prompted by the drop we saw in the S&P on Friday. So perhaps a few interesting things happening in the background. 
I certainly notice all the euphoria when I see headlines and you see blogs and tweets and and what have you. So um, it's interesting. But we want to hear how uh, things have been doing on your side, Moritz, since we spoke in December. And then maybe dig a little bit deeper today into the trend stuff, which we maybe sometimes skip over a little bit quickly to get to the questions. But today, why don't we dig in a little bit deeper? Sure. I mean, let's maybe recap where we started with this. Remember in October, November, around that time, we were still in a drawdown. I was in a drawdown. I'm not sure about you, but I guess you guys as well. Yeah. And we were saying, maybe just, you know, bypassingly, but um, we were saying, well, you know, with a bit of luck, 2020 is going to be a positive year. And it turned out to be that way, just by a scratch. I mean, I ended the year 2020 on on a positive note. And really, that was due only to December. We had these two major months, I think, in 2020, March and December, essentially polar opposites, right? And, you know, we were just making money off of those trends that started, especially in the commodities, the grains, bean oil, soybean meal, soybeans, wheat, Kansas wheat, corn, all of that performing very strongly. Iron ore, copper, all of that stuff, right? So that kind of like took me over the line, moved me over the line into the black in 2020. And then so this year, it just continued in the same fashion. Like coming out of the gates, we're now halfway through January. And I emailed you earlier this week that I probably had the best trend following start to the year that I can remember. I'm not sure if it is the best ever. It may be the best ever. But I think when I emailed you Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, whenever that was, I was up a bit more than 9% for the month. On Thursday, I was up 12.5%. And then as you alluded to, Friday was a give back day. And I'm now up 8.81% for the year. So that is that is quite something, right? Absolutely. And when I look at the the portfolio and the way it is positioned, I have, by the way, I, I will mention that in a bit, but um, when we spoke with Jerry probably a year ago, you know, we were speaking about, you know, let's call them synthetic markets. I don't like that word. To me, they're spreads, right? And whether, you know, those could have a, a place in the portfolio. And I was doing research on that and I completed that research and I started trading some of the spreads in a trend following way. But anyway, so I now distinguish outright positions and spread positions. But on the outright positions, I have 21 positions on. And out of the 21, 21 are long. <laughs> There's not a single short, right? Yeah. Equities are long. Commodities are long. Currencies are still long. The bonds are no longer there. Right now, I don't have any positions. I got out of them. And the, the longest trade, and you know, I just printed that out just to give you some more background. The, the position sure. that I have on since the longest point in time or the longest duration is the Nikkei. The Nikkei, I got long the Nikkei on the 5th of June last year. Also copper last year in June, right? So those are kind of like positions that I, I'm carrying for a long time. And the most recent is um, something like uh, gas oil, for instance, is a, is a fairly recent position. So let's see how that works. I I must say, and this is kind of like tying back to the discussion that we had many, many times over with um, open trade equity, out of the, I, I did the numbers, out of the 21 outright positions that I have on, um, let me just read that here so that I don't make a mistake. Three of those positions have a negative open trade equity right now. That is euro, US dollar, bean oil. I got into the bean oil trade relatively late and it turned against me just a bit, right? And the Swiss franc. So those are negative open trade equity positions for me. They're very small. So here the exit is still the initial stop. And I have one other position, GASA, which I just mentioned, which I've entered recently, that has positive open trade equity, actually. But it hasn't moved as much yet so that the my exit is a different type of exit, a trailing stop type of exit. It is still the initial stop there. So what does that mean? That means that out of the 21 positions that I have on four are kind of like still in that risk zone, right? But 17, and that's about 81% of my portfolio, have an open trade equity, have developed open trade equity to such a magnitude that even if it turned against me now, I will be a winner, assuming there's no gaps in the markets and none of that stuff, right? Then sure. if you look just at closed equity, if you look at that curve and not you know the day-to-day -day valuation curve, then I will finish those trades with a positive P&L. And that 
does something to me. It probably does something to every trader. It makes me much more relaxed about the current profit that I see because I don't want to repeat what we said about being liberal with open trade equity and not becoming too tight with these stops, but that that is what I do. I, I have those positions on. They're working. They're winning. I have absolutely no intention of cutting them back or reducing my position, taking profits or any of that type of stuff. I'll essentially let them go and see where they end up. And to, to tie that back into many of the interesting discussions that we had about valued risk and volatility control and vol control being an overlay and you know all these type of things. So in preparation for that podcast, what I did is I looked at some of the markets, four to be precise, that are some of the most profitable for me right now. And those are corn, soybean meal, soybeans, and sugar. Those have just had massive trends. Mm -hmm. And what I've done is I've calculated the realized volatility of those markets for the past 20 days. Why 20 days? 20 days is for good or bad, for some reason. It is, it is a risk measure or a volatility look back window that the industry tends to use because it's kind of like 20 business days, one calendar month, right? Yeah. Whether you use 30 or 15 or 40, it doesn't really matter that much, I think, but let's stick with 20. So what has happened is that soybean meal oil vol has increased from 13 to 26. It has doubled since the start of December to now. Soybeans from 14 to 20, sugar from 24 to 31, and corn from... 11 to 20 since Christmas. If you're vault controlling these positions, those are the winners in your portfolio. They're the winners in my portfolio right now. If I were to vault control them because they develop upside vol, which is positive for me, then that means I would be taking profits because I would be reducing the position size. I would cut the position back because it is too volatile for my volatility target. I'm not doing that. But I just want to repeat that when I looked at this this morning, I was really going like, well, thank God I don't do that. Why would I? I would not be up 12% on Thursday, close to 9% right now, had I cut those positions in half. And the volatility dynamic over the past month would essentially have forced me to do that if I did like a strict fall control using volatility instead of ATR. And some people do that. So this to me is important that those overlays, fall control, and that is really at the risk of repeating the things, and, and I'll stop right there. They often work counter to trend. It is an overlay that has nothing to do with the trend position, right? And if volatility develops, and by the way, let me say that, volatility tends to be historically and empirically mean reverting and clustering. You're sometimes seeing a volatility cluster, so something goes into a new volatility regime, stays there, then enters another volatility regime after some point in time. But within that regime, the day-to-day -day movements are mean reverting. So what that means is that you have the propensity, you're at risk of taking a vol control position because vol is high right now. It spikes up, right? You're reducing your position size. And the odds are that you're going to reverse that same action at some point in the not-too-distant future because of the mean reversion characteristics of volatility itself. So volatility will come back down with a certain probability and you will then again increase your position. But you have absolutely no idea of knowing how price will have developed between the time you did the vol control trade and, and now the reversion trade, right? In some of the asset classes, such as equities, there is a relationship, a negative correlation between vol and price, right? But that is not all too clear in commodities. That is not all too clear in currencies. And it's definitely not clear in bonds. So that's why I don't do it. So let's stop the vol control thing there, right? No, I mean, I think it's a good illustration. And 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 I think that, that this is definitely something people need to pay attention to there are definitely firms out there we know that uses vol control. Mm -hmm. At Don, we use a diff. We don't use vol control. We use a overlay in terms of risk management. So we want to manage risk, and it's not just based on vol. And then in my own uh, model portfolio that I went through over the um, holidays in more detail, I don't. I do exactly like you. I don't use any adjustment trades. It's just a roll position. And actually, in a sense, I think that. Maybe last year in in general, but certainly in a period like like we see now, I think systems in general that don't do it can uh, perform uh, more strongly. But of course, you can also find periods where the opposite is is is, mm -hmm. is the case, right? I mean, if we were to have a massive reversion now of all these long trades, had you taken reduced your positions, of course you're going to lose less. I mean, it goes both ways. 
But I agree with you. And and actually, I think for those who do DIY trend following, who want to build their own systems, I think this is the way forward. I think the rest is too complicated for what you get for it. So I, I would also, which is what I do, would also take that approach. I ran a couple of tests. This is uh, this is not recent. It's the time ago, some you know, some time ago. But like you say, you know, vol control and 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 the the impact of that, the result of that, can be a positive. I mean, we do know it. You know, you need to pay commissions. Those trades are not for free, right? Uh, you're crossing bid offer and things like that. I've also mentioned that in my observation, it increases the average loss per trade that I have in the portfolio. Now, there's something happening when you change the composition of the portfolio if you weigh it towards the financials so if you have something like a 60 40 you do trend following primarily say on bonds and equities risk parity type of thing ball control does work there because it works in favor of the return characteristics of those assets especially equities equities down vol up you reduce your position it's kind of like a momentum trade right your vol control becomes an amplifier to momentum but if I do the same exercise, same system, nothing changes. Only thing that changes is the portfolio composition. Less concentration in equities, much more commodities, or commodities only. Commodities in FX, it's kind of like, you know, go back to, you know, ask what Jerry has been trading in, in, in the 80s. It was probably dominated by the commodities because not much else, other stuff was around. The opposite is true. Vol control hurts you. So pick your poison. I'm still not sure why people want to have constant vol or vol at around the same level all the time. It doesn't give me a benefit. I'm quite happy to have 15 at some point and 25 at another. It doesn't have to be 20 all the time. But some people, apparently, they they cannot live with, with that fluctuation anymore, even though 20 years ago, everybody was able to do that because volatility control systems just weren't around. It's just it got out of fashion for reasons that I don't understand. And the other thing that is is an observation and kind of like a mainstay observation that, that really I don't get is the desire to have low volatility overall, which I which I really don't get because you can control your exposure by your investment amount, right? But for whatever reason, people want to have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine percent vol, even 10, which used to be kind of like the average realized fall of those strategies probably three years ago, most of them now are even lower than 10, which I find amazing. Yeah, but you know what? I And this is just thinking out of what you just said, a, a sort of a gut reaction to what you said. And I think it's to do with the fact that we now live in a low interest rate environment, mm-hmm. have been for a while, and therefore expected returns are much lower because you don't get anything. And therefore, I think it's changed the way we look at returns, at risk. We don't want to take it. We're happy to get 3 or 4% per year. But you're right. I mean, the old days that you couldn't have raised any money if you were coming out with a product giving people 3%. Yeah, I agree. The only firm I know that has been able to do that is Crable. They had not their, <laughs> that high return, so you had to lever them up. But they actually raised a lot of money. But I get your point, and I agree with it. It's it's almost like we don't want to touch anything that is volatile. And the funny thing is that some of the products that have blown up in the past are not these necessarily volatile products. It's the one that looked safe and had no volatility like Absolutely. long-term capital, Bernie Madoff. You the nail on the head, right? Yeah. I mean, right. you as done, you are at the, I would say, uh, above average level of volatility and trend following with yeah. your uh, offshore fund, at least, right? Sure. Firms such as Dreis or Mulvaney or, you know, yeah. Chesapeake in the old days, they had much higher volatility than CTAs on average have today. Look at Winton, right? And they're still there. So I, I, I don't, I don't know. You, you're right. I mean, there may be many drivers for the reason that people want low volatility, but they're also turning a blind eye to the consequences, I think. First of all, the lower your volatility, as you know, right, the lower your expected return, point A. But point B is that the fees that are being charged inside of investment products, they don't correlate one-to-one to to the reduction in volatility. So what I mean by that is, say you have a 0.5 sharp ratio, right? And there's funds out there that go, look, you need to invest in renewable energy 
equities. There's these ETFs out there or mutual funds out there that, you know, create a basket of these equities and, and uh, that's the way forward. Okay. So the historical, let's say the shop ratio is 0.5, right? And what they do is they say, we offer that to you with a volatility control overlay so that you, dear investor, do not have to suffer from equity volatility, which 20 years ago you did, but, but now we're doing it at 7% vol all the time. And our fee for that fund is, because we're doing so good research, is 1.5% per year. And then there's the cost of the wrapper, another 50 basis points. So let's call it it's 2% a year, right? Okay, cool. So it's 7% vol with a 0.5 shop ratio. Your return on average is 3.5. You're now paying 2% away in fees. That is fixed, but people don't see that. So what you're actually buying is you're buying a 1.5% expected return at 7 vol. And I don't get that, but people, people seem to be turning a blind eye to what they do not do is they do not put into relation volatility and fees. If you have a product that is at 30 vol, something that you know, Niels, something that I know, Niels, I'm not trading at 30 right now, but you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not unhappy if it is 30 either. If there's 2% fees in 30 vol, it's hardly visible, right? But if there's 2% fees in 7 vol, that is kind of like it's dripping out of the product every day. It's a massive negative drift that becomes visible. So you need to have super high shop ratio strategies or super convicted trade ideas to actually make that work. And of course, you know, it's being sold in the way that it will work. But reality oftentimes shows us that, you know, investment managers don't keep their promises <laughs> and, you know, the stuff that underperforms. So it's, it's I, I, I find it tragic, really. No, I I completely agree with that. And 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 as I said, I think it's a combination of maybe low interest environment, so we have low expectation of returns. But I also think that, and this is from memory, because when I started in 1991 in this industry, um, there were a lot of firms with healthy doses of volatility and healthy returns, right? But uh, I think it changed a little bit for me from memory. It changed when the institutions really got involved, right? Whether it's hedge funds or whether it's CTAs. I think that some of the firms that today are really big saw this trend coming, no pun intended here, but but they saw institutions starting to get involved. They also, I think, saw correctly that they were not going to buy your fully full leverage 30% annualized volatility product. So they started to offering low of all products and they probably mm -hmm. de-geared their products so it gave them more capacity and all of that stuff. That's one part of it. And then the other thing that I wonder about and that is let's just say that you are super successful you build a firm and you end up raising 10 billion dollars in AUM. I don't know but I have a feeling that you have a natural bias to say ooh I'm not going to lose that golden cow so let me just reduce the volatility a little bit further because i you kind of become more risk averse as a natural bias when you become as a businessman yeah i think so as a gatherer right and yeah and i completely understand that dynamic and i understand the intention that is not illogical to do for the owner of the investment management business but it's not necessarily to the benefit of the end investor. Absolutely right? not. It's only to the benefit of the end investor if fees downscale absolutely proportional to the level of fall, but they don't mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. So it's it's a dilemma. And really, you know, I think we agree on that. And, and I've said that before. If your intention, if your aim and your goal with trading is to make money, it is mine. I'm not just doing that for my enjoyment. It, it's it's a great deal of fun. I love it, right? So that is that is that is great for me. Uh, but I do it to make money. And if if I make one or two percent a year, if I trade at a volatility that allows me to make one or two percent a year, then I could as well just stop because that is not going to be meaningfully changing anything in my life, right? And in essence, if you then translated that into real P&L after inflation, it may well still be negative, right? So I cannot do that. I must aim for something that is juicier than that. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, no, I completely agree. 
I might might come up with a couple of follow up questions to your um, to your rundown. Let me just run through what's happening on our side. So I'm only going to talk about 2021. Uh, I mean, on our side, this week was slightly up, nothing major. Certainly not off to the races like you are, Moritz. So uh, a little bit. Somewhat less than 8%, let's call it that, but still positive for the year. And what has helped us this week was really the gains in the grain sector, predominantly fixed income was okay, but we did lose money in currencies and we did lose money in stocks. So that's that. Our volatility strategy also had a positive week, so it's also off for the year. Now, where I can go into a bit more detail is is my own sort of trend-following model portfolio. And that was down this week, but it's still up about 1.7% for the year. What I've seen is that equities so far this month, this year, doing best. Energy and grains are the other two top three sectors. And then to the downside are really currencies, followed by precious metals. Now, funnily enough, so you mentioned this thing about your oldest position was Nikkei. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Same for me, right? So I'm just sitting here with See? the papers. Trend following. Right, this is it. So as as people who've listened to my run-through of the model, I use uh, different to Moritz, but there's no wrong or right here. So I use different types of trend following models. And I'm just looking at the signal sheet here, and the oldest position that the system has on is a long position in Nikkei, and it was initiated on the fall, on the 11th of April last year still long so anyways just a fun fact really that both these type of uh, models yeah, were also what's interesting you got in to that position two months ahead of me right and we're still sitting sure. on a profit in that oh, position no, sure. so it also yeah, shows yeah. there is that dispersion among yeah. trend follows eventually we will jump on that trade somebody will yeah. do it sooner than the other person but eventually we'll catch it yeah and then i have in just to stay with the nikkei i mean since i run different types of models i got a position on that is still on in August and also one in September in uh, November. So I've got three entries right now in in the Nikkei. But similar to you, and I'm looking at one and a half page of signals, current positions, and I see, and th so there's quite a few uh, when you break them down by model, and I see only like two short positions. The rest are just long. So the only two shorts are short net gas for one of the models, and the other short is gold. So that's probably some of the kind of faster type models. Anyways, just a, a, an interesting thing that that all trend followers, I think, at the moment is seeing a lot of long positions in, in their portfolio. The other thing I noticed this week, and I don't know if you monitor this, uh, Moritz, but I actually every day calculate what how much would the system lose if it got stopped out of all positions today. So I call that kind of the open or stop to uh, risk to stop ratio, uh, uh, number. And so last week, that number was about 20.12%. So about 20%. That's probably towards the higher end. So if everything got stopped out in a day, 20% down, boom. That number today has narrowed to 14%. And I think that's quite interesting because it shows you how stops can be dynamic. So even if not a lot of things have happened, obviously clearly some markets have happened and that triggers your stops to to move. And so today you could say that the portfolio as a whole is somewhat less risky than it was a week ago, even though performance didn't move a lot down a percent, percent and a half or so for the week. So I thought that was an interesting observation and I I, I don't pay that much attention to it so I can't say if that's a normal thing that it can move that much in a week, but pretty substantial move actually in terms of tightening stops. It's eighteen percent for me. I just had a look. That's why I stepped stepped away. Eighteen percent. Yeah. Well, there we go. So pretty much similar type risk. Okay. I mean, the only thing I'd really love because I don't have it myself on on in any of the products that I touch. That's just. Bitcoin from a pure trend following perspective, how how your models have kind of reacted to Bitcoin the last year or so, both kind of the way down, but then this massive, massive, massive bull market we're in, how does it handle that? I'm just curious. 
<laughs> yeah. So uh, unsurprisingly, I'm long Bitcoin. Sure. And uh, I'm I'm trading it in exactly the same way as I trade all of my other markets. Um, but I haven't been long all the time. Uh, I remember that was actually that was actually the weekend when we were in New York together more than a year mm-hmm. ago. So something like fourteen or fifteen months ago. On that weekend, Bitcoin had a a massive break lower, and uh, I wasn't trading the futures back then. I was uh, still you know doing the spot trading. And actually, I've stopped trading the futures in my trend following system because of the very expensive basis there. And then really the only change that I remember is the breakdown that we had in um, March of this year. Right. And I actually opened a short position in Bitcoin because that's what my system told me to do. Obviously, Bitcoin found a bottom and uh, that short position didn't work and I closed with a loss. And I was then sitting there. My system didn't immediately find grip with that price action because it was really looking for a much higher highs uh, from that point onward. So I don't think I had a trend following Bitcoin long position for probably going into the summer, if I remember that correctly. But then, you know, at some point it opened a long and never looked back. Yeah. So it's it's just been that amazingly great trade. And, you know, it, it has moved in such way, so rapidly also, that, you know, you can, uh, even the move lower last weekend, you know, right. Right, I, didn't, yeah. I don't run my system on the weekend because the product that I'm trading is not available for me to trade on the weekend. But it moved from like, you know, 41,000 down to uh, close to 30 or 31. Yeah. But that didn't stop my position out. My, right. my stop isn't even there, you sure. know. Yeah. No, no, I mean, it's uh, it's it's interesting. And and even though I said to you early in the week, I don't really want to make our conversation too Bitcoin-ish. I actually have a follow-up question because I read an article and, and as you know, I I don't have anything against Bitcoin. I think actually as a trading product, it's, it's great. And I think mm-hmm. as long as liquidity is there, I think probably it's a really good diversifier in, in a trend-following portfolio. That's also why I wanted to showcase how well it's done for you so people can see the value of, as Jerry rightly pointed out in our last conversation before Christmas, um, that we shouldn't be really opinionated about these markets. We should just look at them as any other market, right? And I think that's a good that's a good reminder. But Bitcoin, to me, still is, is an, kind of a strange market, just the way, because I can't really figure out, you know, what's really the value of it right and so i came across this article and it is a biased article i guess so but i i did wanted to ask your opinion about it as our resident bitcoin expert here and and what this guy so this guy apparently and by the way he's affiliated with research affiliates which by the way is the same firm as campbell harvey is so i i, I take them on on the surface Rob as a not. kind of a credible yeah. credible firm Although I think this guy is a young guy, which is nothing wrong with that, especially if you're in Bitcoin or it's all the young people like yourself, Moritz, that are uh, involved in it. When I read it, I thought it was well articulated, even though I couldn't tell whether it's true or not. But he brought up a couple of things that I wanted to ask you about. One is he mentions that what a lot of people may not have may not be aware of is that a couple of years ago, a few years ago, that the te- technical details had changed away from what it was originally maybe designed as, digital cash. And I don't know the details exactly as to, um, it's something to do, I think, with the block size being limited or something like that. Anyways, but you talk about that actually it makes it impossible really for people like Amazon and things like that to adopt it as a means of exchange, but that that has kind of changed its status to digital gold, which I can certainly see a lot of the narrative talk about that. But it also means that if you really saw it spreading widely around the world, that it would be somewhat limited in terms of the number of transactions you could do in a day in Bitcoin compared to the number of people who would have it if if everyone in the world kind of adopted it. 
So my question is just simple to you. The first one is just, is it true that something actually has happened that kind of changes, quote unquote, the purpose of Bitcoin in your opinion? So interesting question. And by the way, I am still far, far, far away and probably always will be far, far away from being an expert in Bitcoin. There are so many more people, you know, that have gone down that rabbit hole and they're looking at that from so many different angles than I do. So I probably have a um, bit of an understanding of it, but I don't want to be an expert in it. I'd love to be an expert in it, but I don't think I can say that I am. But I know enough, I think, to hopefully give a good answer to your question. So in 2009, I don't think, if I remember that correctly, Satoshi Nakamoto didn't say explicitly that Bitcoin is designed to be a payment system and provide payments rails to, say, retailers, right? He has solved cryptographically a double spending problem, etc. And then, you know, what the market does with Bitcoin is what the market does with Bitcoin. It came to the point where there has been a fork, right? And forks are not a problem. You're keeping your amount of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has forked into Bitcoin Cash and, you know, the old Bitcoin chain remains. It has also now Bitcoin Satoshi Vision exists. But Bitcoin Cash was forked away from Bitcoin in order to have a larger block size and not the limited block size that the true Bitcoin protocol has to provide a better solution for payments, right? To allow for more payments, allow for more transactions to be included in one block and then that block gets solved, right? So you can have an increased number of transactions on Amazon, whatever the case may be. Now, the fork isn't a problem for the owners of Bitcoin because you keep your original Bitcoin and you get an equal amount of the fork, right? So it's kind of like a free call option. You will, you're in right. short to hold the winner. Whoever wins that race, you will be long both, right? So you can just uh, hold both uh, and you're not paying for it. What has happened is that, as you know, Bitcoin has, I don't know how, how, how many X's it has gone up since and Bitcoin cash is down 80%. So the market has wow. voted what it wants to do with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And the same is true for Bitcoin Satoshi Vision. So what that means is I think the market has realized that Bitcoin has lost that race. It is not a payment system and it probably will never be a payment system, even though now the light work, the lightning network can be used underpinning it to facilitate more transactions. But there are so many other coins out there that are so much a million times better suited to be used for payments than Bitcoin, that Bitcoin will no longer be able, I think, to win that race and it's no longer competing. And probably that is part of the reason why the narrative has changed. The narrative has changed. And I remember that, yes, it's true. It is this alternative currency that's independent, decentralized and independent from at least the government, right? I don't think, and, and yes, between 20. Uh, 2009 and you know 2013, which is when I first got involved in that stuff, um, that certainly has been the prevailing narrative. And people were talking about it in that way, as far as I remember. The people that I speak to Bitcoin about today, and by the way, Friday I had an interview on Real Vision with uh, Nickel Digital, one of the world's largest um, digital arbitrage funds, hedge fund. So they are the expert, not me, right? Right. But none of these guys is talking about Bitcoin as a replacement for cash or as a replacement for a payments system. It's either digital gold or a store of value. That's that's narrative. And, and I'm starting to kind of like see why that's true, you know, why that could be true. You know, some of them say Bitcoin has already run the race against gold and has won that race, but the market hasn't realized it yet. And it's now because of people such as Michael Saylor and Robert Breedlove and, you know, many uh, Preston Peach, uh, right, who, who bring that story across that actually Bitcoin has superior properties in all aspects of what makes money or what determines good money than gold, so that they think it's only a matter of time before the market realizes that Bitcoin is a better form of gold because it's programmable. It's more secure. It cannot be counterfeit. You know where it is. It does end at 21 million. Gold does not end anywhere. If the gold price is high enough, people are going to take their picks and shuffles and they go looking for gold. The amount of gold, the gold stock 
increases between 1.2, sorry, 1.8 and 2% per year, which means that if you think that gold is your inflation hedge, which many people think it is, and I'm not saying it isn't for, for like over time, gold has kept its value much better than anything else, really, when you compare it to the fiat system, right? But if something, if the stock increases by 2% a year, if you compound that, what that mathematically means is that after 38 years, which is well within anybody's lifespan, the amount has doubled, which means you've lost 100% because there's now twice the quantity outstanding. Well, I guess that depends on what the price does. If the price goes up by 100% in 38 years, you haven't lost anything, right? Yeah, but Bitcoin doesn't, right? So Bitcoin stays 21 million. It doesn't expand. The Bitcoin base, the amount of coins, does not expand by 2% a year. It cannot. But gold does. So, you know, from that angle, um, many people say, uh, and, and maybe I only want to hear what I want to hear, and I completely then admit that that sometimes may be the case, right? But they say from that viewpoint, Bitcoin is superior to gold. Sure. You can have both, right? But I don't think it is living in the cash world anymore. No. Uh, to me, that was quite useful because I've heard that as kind of the narrative, but you're probably, you're much closer to it. And I think that it makes more sense to me, at least, if that narrative have changed. But the other thing that this guy makes a point in the article, you spoke about other coins, right? He talks about Tether, and the issuance of Tether, and there's some kind of conversion you can do, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I don't know anything about Tether, except every time I hear about it, I hear about investigations and stuff like that. So he has a chart in this article that I shared with you where he shows the correlation about issuance of Tether and then subsequently the price increase in Bitcoin. And I guess his argument, whether we agree or disagree, doesn't really matter, I guess his argument is that there could well be some manipulation slash fraud involved in this parabolic move we're seeing because it seems to come after a massive issuance of Tether. I was just curious to hear your view on this since you're closer to it than I am. And I don't have the full picture on that. Bitfinex probably does, but but let's let's start at the beginning, right? So Tether is a stable coin in the same way that USDC is a stable coin. That's, by the way, owned by Coinbase. Why do these stable coins exist? Right? They're kind of like saying, here's a tether, and a tether equates to one US dollar, and one USDC equals one US dollar. And a, a key reason why they exist in the first place is because the majority of crypto exchanges are not connected to the fiat banking system which means that you cannot wire your US dollars to them and exchange them for Bitcoin. Bitfinex, by the way, which is the sponsor of Tether, is one of those exchanges. You cannot send them your fiat money. You can send them Tether, you can send them other coins, and you can trade Ether versus Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash versus Monero, whatever you want to do on that exchange. But if you want to go back convert your hopefully profits back into a fiat system, into a real dollar or a real euro, you need to first send it to an exchange, a digital assets exchange, that allows for fiat conversion. Bitstamp, for instance, is one of them. Coinbase is another one. There's a couple. But the majority, by number, are not connected to the fiat system. Okay. So what that means is that there's a lot of liquidity in Tether, because people trade on exchanges such as Deribit, such as Bitfinex, right? They're Binance. They're very, very large exchanges. They have a lot of liquidity, and there's a lot of people connected to them, right? But if you want to get out of a position, and if you kind of like want to get flat in dollar terms, then USDT, Tether, or you know USDC is your option that's available. If you don't want to immediately, you know, route it back to a digital assets exchange that's connected to the fiat system. So Tether is sponsored slash owned by Bitfinex, as far as I know. And the allegations of there being something wrong with it, i.e. Tether not being 100% backed by dollars on a one-for-one -one basis. That stuff is out there since, I think, at least 2017. 
right? Mm -hmm. So where there's smoke, there's fire. You could say, you know, the Financial Times has reported on wire cards since, you know, 2015. And, you know, it took five years. Right, right, sure. Until people actually realized that there was fire, right? So I'm, I'm definitely not here on the air saying that everything is right. And in fact, I do not know. But Bitfinex has never said, they say they, they have the assets to back every tether. They're not saying that it is on a dollar for dollar basis. You know, they have Bitcoin, they have a, a very small loan that they have outstanding that they're using as collateral against that stuff. I have no insight into their balance sheet or their book and how they're set up. So I do not know, right? But until now, Nobody has been able to break through and actually, you know, point to something where I say, like, look, this is here is really the problem, right? right. It's Tether continues to trade at about one. It is a stable coin. So, um, but what I think many articles do get wrong, because this seems to be a little bit of a um, of a fancy topic or popular topic these days, now that Bitcoin is at about 40,000, right now it maybe is at 36,000, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's out there, it's up there, is to say, oh, well... Um, uh, this is only because tethers are being printed out of thin air and being used right. to buy Bitcoin. And it's kind of like this fraudulent scheme that goes on that, you know, a tether is printed, a Bitcoin is purchased, and then there's kind of like these, these guys working in the background. They then convert that Bitcoin into real US dollar on a crypto exchange that's connected to the fiat system, and they translate it into real dollars, right? Okay. Well... I don't know if that's true, but what, what I think is that a lot of these articles, they're looking at it in a one-sided way, saying that tethers are only issued if Bitcoin is purchased, but that is not true. Think about, and, and that is factually not true. Think about a person that is long Bitcoin, say, since summer of last year, right? That person has once entered the system transferred real US dollars to an exchange, converted that into Bitcoin, and maybe now he or she trades on Bitfinex or Binance or any of these other exchanges because there's a lot of liquidity there. If they want to take profits, if they want to get out of Bitcoin, they sell their Bitcoin at 40,000, right? Because it's been a life-changing moment for them. If they want to get out on, on Bitfinex, the only way out is to sell it against Tether which means Bitfinex needs to issue Tether. But it's kind of like the other side. It's issued not to buy Bitcoin. It's issued to facilitate the exit mm -hmm. from a profitable mm -hmm. position, right? So I don't think there is this one-to-one uh, -one pump and dump scheme going on where uh, somebody just issues that stuff in, in order to purchase it. I mean, wouldn't that be akin to the Fed issuing dollars and buying bonds? <laughs> well, that's exactly my thought, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing. You could say the Fed is likely more solvent than Bitfinex, right? But where, where, where shall we end that point? I, I need well, to end it by saying I really do not know. No, sure. And my feeling is that all the reporting on Bitcoin, especially now that the price has gone so wild, is, is either to the extreme... It's it's onward and upward, and we're never looking back. And if you're not in it, you're a fool. Or it's it's a fraud, it's a bubble, it's going to pop, and you're losing all your money, and somebody will go after you with it. There's no middle ground, it seems, sometimes. And and I I would really like to speak for that middle ground. And I do that by my Naivete is saying, I don't know much about it, even though I've read a bit about it and we're talking about it right now. But still, you know, to me it is, yeah, I need to really look at that from a trading point of view as a trader. It's a trade that I cannot afford to miss, but is nevertheless a trade that I need to size appropriately. I cannot swing for the fences and go to the one side and say, onward and upward, I'm not doing anything else but being long Bitcoin. I'm not doing that. But I also don't want to go on the other side and say it's a fraud. And it doesn't have value. You know, a lot of people say, and I want to really finish on that, they say it's not an asset because it doesn't have value and it doesn't have a cash flow and you can't discount those cash flows into something that is a net present value today. Really, are you kidding me? I mean, what does? And, you know, how are you discounting that stuff anyway? Gold doesn't have it. And by the way, who has ever exactly counted and taken stock of the gold in Fort Knox? You're not allowed in it. You're not allowed to go into the vaults in Switzerland and, you know, make an independent 
numeration of the amount of gold that sits there, right? So who knows how much it actually is? And only because weed and corn and soybeans are real acid, yes, they are. I mean, they're perishable. If you don't eat them, they go bad, right? They don't have a cash flow that you can NPV to today. So a lot of things exist, fiat money being one of them, your cash that doesn't have a cash flow that it spins off right now, at least. What is value? Value is really only that what somebody is ready to be paying for an asset. And if something trades out there and there's a market there, two-sided market, people willing to buy and sell and have bits and offers, and then to me, that is an asset. Indeed. I don't have an opinion about it myself, but you make a lot of interesting points. So I think let's leave it at that. I was just going to finish off by saying that if people are concerned about a lot of these allegations and this, that, and the other, I guess one way where they could participate. I know it's, as you say, it's not the cheapest way or the most efficient way is to trade it via futures, right? I mean, at the end of the day, if you're concerned about all of these, I have to convert from Tether to this, that, and the other, what have you. This is what I think is the beauty of the futures markets is that you can actually do it in a, despite the fact that price moves like, you know, crazy sometimes, you can actually do it through a perfectly legal authorized regulated means of trading yeah and so i think that that to me makes it more legitimate than before so that's great i completely i mean we've been going on we, for we, almost we love the cme let me just say that point but we, we love the cme and the futures contract is there i've said it before the futures contract is expensive so if people do their homework and they do the calculation of you know how much more expensive the futures is vis-a-vis -vis the spot I agree with you. It's an easy instrument. We love the CME. It's, it's easy for us to trade. The US is kind of like limited in terms of products that are available to get exposure because Grayscale trades at an about equal premium, right? And here, for whatever reason, Switzerland and Germany are kind of like leading the pack. You wouldn't believe that. I mean, Switzerland has the Crypto Valley. I live in crypto Zoom. Valley. Exactly, right? <laughs> but most of the money, most of the AUM, in exchange traded products linked to Bitcoin trading without a premium are actually in Germany, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there is one product, BTCE, which is um, which is an exchange traded commodity tracking Bitcoin. Um, and that has been for the past couple of weeks the second most actively traded exchange traded product on etc. It goes to show there's ways to do it. There's ways to get exposure without being long spot Bitcoin, without having a wallet and all that type of stuff, right? You buy a product through your broker. It has an ISIN. You can book it. You can account it. It's there. It works like any other instrument. Yeah. From my initial thought of it not becoming too Bitcoin-centric today, I thought actually we did a pretty good <laughs> job at not following the rules. So there we are. And I completely missed just the fact that we've been going on for 55 minutes now and we have still not, my mistake, we have still not answered any of the questions that were waiting for us. Good, so let's... Good, good news is, Niels, there will be point, there will be a time going forward where we will be talking less about Bitcoin. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's jump straight to the questions because... Those are really important to us because they come from all of you listening. So one question that has been waiting for you, more, or at least it came in via you, I should say, you sent it to me, is from Carlos. And Carlos writes, since April 2020, I have listened to the entire catalog of Systematic Investor chronologically since the first episode. So thank you for that, Carlos. That would be my first comment. As I wanted to understand how your views might have impacted by the stock market rebound that occurred in March. In your December 13th episode with Mark, Nils mentioned that trend followers didn't do well because the post-March 23, 2020 uptrend occurred too quickly. Most trend following systems had not seen such quick rebounds before. My questions are, one, is it reasonable to assume that trend followers should now also incorporate breakout scenarios that would pick up a trend reversal that might happen within, say, less than 30 days? 
And if so, would it be fair to base the probability of such a scenario occurring on how rapidly the market initially drops? I know you folks are not value investors and that you don't typically follow individual stocks except for Jerry. But some of the value stocks were so oversold based on value criteria in March 2020 that even I understood that there were decent buying opportunities. Now, Carlos goes on with a longer comment. I'm going to... It's a very long question, actually. But I think the gist of it is, generally speaking, and I think we touched on it in our 23rd of December episode or thereabouts, what are the takeaways from 2020? What is this new data that we clearly didn't know prior to 2020? What is that doing to our systems? And I, I, I have a good feeling of what your answer is going to be, Moritz, but I, I, I want to hear it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think we discussed that already where I said whatever happened in, you know, I don't want to say whatever. We know what happened in March and April of, of, of 2020. Uh, to the equity markets or to markets in general, right? But to me, this is this is not really that outlierish as, as it is for many other people. You know, it's part of that distribution, it's part of that sample, and it didn't trigger me, and it doesn't trigger me going forward to make any changes to the way that I trade. I really want to stay steadfast and unchanged to these periods and not react to them prematurely. And now, you know, say that I need to trade shorter look-back windows in order to cope better with these type of environments, I, I don't do that because the data doesn't tell me that I should. That's the easy answer. Yeah, no, and it's a good answer. So, but I'm going to answer differently, Carlos, just so you have something different to think about as well. So I'm going to divide it into what we do at Don and how we think of things and what my model portfolio trend following is doing. So at Don, I think it is an interesting data point, meaning, one, it can give us new ideas for research. And of course, we're not trying to fix something for the short term just so that we coped better over the summer of 2020. Because actually, overall, I think most trend followers did okay in 2020, even though they're, you know, so that would be my first point. But the second point I would say is that just the way we do things where we don't have any discretion in terms of how we pick parameters, when we get new data, the parameter picks will be influenced by default. And so that might mean that some of our parameter picks will change based on this new data. Not that it, you know, it's not like, oh, we're only looking at one year back in time, so it's going to completely change. No, no. But it will be part of the data set, so I can't say it has no influence. That's one thing. So new research on one side, potentially, has to you have to look at it. And the second thing is just because we do everything completely systematically in terms of parameter picks and all that, it could have an influence. Now, on my model portfolio, I would say, like Moritz, it doesn't change a thing. And the reason being is that if you listen to the episode 120 where I went into the full details as to the design process, this is something that we had thought about, meaning we wanted different types of trend-following models. One of the groups are much faster reacting. And this is also why the portfolio as a whole did really well last year, including March and over the summer and all of that stuff. So so I think it, it it can give you ideas as to how you design your systems. It may not change anything. But again, and I think I went into that, the way I and, and my partners originally designed this trend-following approach is different to how Jerry and Mort do things. But there is no wrong or right. I mean, you choose whatever you want. It was really just to show that you can put some personality into trading models. They don't have to all be the same. But I think it's a great question, and of course, you really should have a medal for going back all the way to the beginning of the systematic investor, and in less than a year, in about nine months, basically go through every single episode. That I appreciate, and I know Moritz absolutely uh, does the same. Gold medal, for sure. So, thanks for that, Carlos. Next question is from James, and this is, I think, more specifically for you, Moritz. Moritz mentioned 
taking a discretionary short on Tesla outside of his system on the last show. So this was sent early January. I saw the next day it opened 5% lower. Did he stay in the trade or cash out? What was his rationalization for this decision? And then a question, I think, on stop loss. Mort uses uses them. Don does not, correct? Is this because you're worried about having your positions targeted by other traders who try to hit stops and get small but profitable market moves out of this? I'm assuming that you use price alerts based on reversals in your indicators instead. And then it goes on a little bit. But the point is about the you know stops or no stops. And last, in the same vein as Jack Swager interviews mentioned, I thought it would be fun if yourself or Moritz and maybe your guest talk about your most memorable trades, even if long ago. Ooh, not sure I can remember any trades really, but Moritz, let's stick with this thing about Tesla. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to stops, no stops. Three questions, right? Tesla, stops, yeah. no stops, and memorable yeah, trades. Yeah. So yeah, Tesla. I have traded Tesla only in my career on the short side, amazingly. So I didn't get any of the enjoyment yeah. and, and, and the pleasure of being long in, in recent months, as uh, for instance, Jerry did, right? But the two times that I've traded Tesla on the short side, I've actually made money. Most people trading it short Fantastic. don't. But yeah. so the I, I remember the trade that I described, the trade idea that I described on that show, I think it was together with Jerry, probably then the 20th of December. Right. Something like that, because you've just mentioned that we were together with Mark on the 13th, so 13 plus 7. Yeah. And it, it's a trade that, you know, we implemented live and with real money in, in our two quads portfolio, which some people may know. But the, the reason is as follows, right? It, it was announced that Tesla would enter the S&P 500. And as soon as that announcement goes out, there is a machine going into something starts, the engine starts, right? This stuff is being front run, but on different time frames and different perspectives ahead of the inclusion date, and then they trade out of it, and they take a short position on the S&P 500. There's a million ways probably to do that. And none of that is anything that I have done. But we were just saying the odds are that on the day itself, on the exclusion day itself, in the last 30 minutes of trading, there's going to be a bunch of ETFs and a bunch of, bunch of closet tracker index funds linked to the S&P 500, right? There's a lot of money that will look to minimize tracking error to the S&P 500 and that cannot afford to slip away from Tesla too much because the index methodology specifies it will enter the S&P as of the close on that day, right? So they were, at least that was our thinking, they were going to be buying aggressively into Tesla stock on that inclusion day as of the close. And that is when we opened the short during those last 30 minutes of that day and uh, it actually did do that. The, t the price of Tesla spiked into the close on the inclusion date. And then came the weekend, I think. And on Monday, all of a sudden, no buyer was left. The ETFs had purchased. This was a done deal, right? And a lot of people had now realized that they're overexposed to Tesla because they're now holding Tesla through their S&P, where it does have a sizable weight. And maybe they're outright long Tesla, right? So odds were that, you know, it is the stopping, the buying is going to stop and maybe it's going to reverse itself on the Monday, which is did, which is the 5% down day. And that's exactly when we took that trade off again. So we made 5% for that trade. I don't want to say that is all, you know, tap me on the shoulder. We're all so clever. That trade could have gone wrong, as can any other trade, especially with Tesla, right? Because it's essentially a, it's a wild stock. That's, that's just call it that did you know from the beginning it would be such a short-term trade actually or was that um, just yes yes okay. we actually okay. had we, we had put that out to uh, our subscribers that that trade has nothing to do with us having a view on tesla or with any system having a signal on tesla it is a well-sized discretionary still quant driven trade if you will but specifically for that purpose and if we had had a loss on the Monday, we would have stopped that trade out with a loss and realized the loss. Because what happens on the Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever, I, yeah. I have no view of that, right? Fair so enough. it was specifically designed for that. Cool. So that that is um, that is Tesla. That's the Tesla story I think now. Some, Tesla is still an interesting stock to trade. But when I, you know, over the, the Christmas break, 
when I digested that trade. This was also when we spoke about the alternative markets, which many people call alternative markets, but I don't, right? When I think about it, I mean, just stepping back, you know, under my Christmas tree, one of the most alternative and craziest markets that we trade is the S&P 500 and any of these equity index markets. You're essentially trading a basket of stocks float weighted with an index committee that meets on a discretionary basis and decides to include Tesla on a re- on the day of their choosing. And we think that this is the most so and, and this thing has a momentum underpinning. It is driven by price sensitive, insensitive buying and selling by the passive industry. And for some wild reason, we all think that this is the, the most normal standard product in the world. Whereas what you're actually trading is an actively managed, kind of quasi-actively managed momentum thing that has an index committee that's the investment manager in the driver's seat that all of a sudden says Tesla is now part of the party. So we we trade that. And at the same time, we say, yeah, but I and or on Cymex, that's an alternative market and such is freight and power. And that just doesn't click to me, right? Anyway, I don't want to repeat that. But fair, that's fair enough. Sec, second point, stops. Stop loss, yeah. I cannot do it without stops. And sure. and 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 the the reason I want my stops there is to calculate my risk. Because if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be able to normalize the expected losses of my positions. I really want every trade to essentially be a bet. I give it the same risk budget the same loss budget, right? And then I just see what it does. But if I don't have a stop loss, then I wouldn't be able to appropriately size my position. And I'll explain why. There's other ways of sizing positions, but say you do without a stop loss and you do it based on volatility, right? So equal volatility across all positions, then you're trading more of euro dollars and you're trading less of natural gas. But if you do not have a stop, then your loss on those positions is an undefined quantity, right? If you don't have a stop, you've just sized natural gas smaller than euro dollar, yes, for sure. But if it doesn't go your way, and if you don't get an, an exit signal at some point, then you know the loss of natural gas may be many times more. All of a sudden, it may become an outlier loss because you don't have a stop compared to a system that does have stops, right? So I really want to force my system, and, and I love that is, you've just said you have, you, you can per, everybody can personalize their systems, but that is a very important point of personalization for me, that, that I'm able to really have an equal loss characteristic and dynamic across all, an equal expected loss dynamic across all the positions in my portfolio, and that I do not allow any of those positions to develop into a loss that outweighs any of the other by a meaningful amount. I don't want that because then it could become dominating. And any of the other position sizing methods, in my opinion, do that. There's there's no way around it. If you don't have a stop, if you don't use a stop, if you don't have a predetermined point of loss where you get out, then I have not found any other position that can do that in that same way. And that gets you into the way of thinking about R multiples and you know these type sure. of things and you know multiples are average true ranges, which is what I do. And it kind of like standardizes my risk reward dynamics in in that way. Sure. No, absolutely cool. Finally, memorable trades. Really, I mean, so many. Really, one one trade that will stick to me forever is crude oil going negative last year, and and I was watching that in real time. You know, watching the price chart going from I I I remember it as if it was yesterday. It was trading at five bucks. The May contract. I wasn't in the May contract. I was in the June contract. Right? It was the May contract that was going negative, right? So I just looked at the May contract, and the thing went from five to four to three, boom to zero. And once it was there, it goes minus five, minus ten, minus twenty, minus thirty, right? So it's yeah. I mean, I'll never forget that, right? And and of course, I I also enjoyed being short the June contract, which kind of like followed the thing, followed the price action in the same direction, not not to the extent that the May contract did. Of course, I'll remember that. I remember waking up to Brexit. I remember waking up to Donald Trump being the president-elect of the United States, both of which happened in 2016, both of which were wild days, wild swings in all asset classes. I remember January 15th, 2015, so six years ago, Switzerland, the S&B decided 
to um, remove the cap of the Swiss franc to the euro, and boom, the Swiss franc went through the roof from, I don't know, what was it? You probably know that better, from 120 to 0.75 or 0.8 to the euro. Something like that. Yep. If you have had the right, the right trade on, that's a life-changing positive moment. It had the risk, actually, that trade had the risk of killing a trend-following trader. If you didn't have the right position on, and not everybody had, right, that trade could have killed you, especially because of the fact that the Swiss franc was and continues to be a managed currency because the SMB is active in, in that market, right? And it was it had such little volatility because it was fighting with that cap all the time. It was trading against it, but it couldn't go higher, right? So it was, it was kind of like stuck there. If you get a signal there and you don't have minimum ATRs or volatility floors, you would have sized that thing to the moon. And if it then goes the wrong way, then that's the game over trade. That's the risk of ruin. So it is therefore always important to look at these markets which have these, which are either manipulated and impacted by parties or which have these uh, very low volatilities to have a view on risk and not overdo it. Yeah, and I think that's a very important point. I think a lot of people became aware of what we talk about when we talk about minimum volatility flaws where you, despite how low the actual volatility goes over a short period of time, that you still, when you size your position, use something that is more realistic for the longer term in terms of volatility because otherwise you can end up with a massive position so really great questions uh, my point to you james would just be that no we we don't use stops at our firm but we manage risk in a very different way and what we're looking for is really the exposure to each market that we build up over time and that's just how we've we've built the model and how we do it Again, nothing right, nothing wrong in terms of how you do it. I would certainly not recommend anyone new to trend following to uh, do it our way. I think it is too, quote unquote, complicated. I think it's much better to uh, do what more do or what I do in my trend following model portfolio. Use stops. They give you a pretty good idea of what your real risk is and you'll be fine, frankly. Morris already mentioned some memorable points in time in our careers. There are many more, but I appreciate that question. I want to move on because I do want to get to Peter's question. Now, Peter, you write to us that you have two questions, but I actually only really see one in your email. Although you say it might be a basic question, nonetheless, you would like to hear it. And and because you hear a lot of people, and I, I agree with that, there's a lot of noise out there saying, oh, this broker is the best, or this platform is better, et cetera, et cetera. What you're really asking is, is there any platforms, brokers that we tend to, um, I wouldn't say recommend, because we don't really recommend anything as such, other than trend following, of course. But I think it's important to know that when Morris and I interact with these firms, we are probably not so much interacting with these newer platforms these things you can where you can trade from your phone and all of that stuff we're probably more in the traditional futures world where you have a proper broker that allows you access to all of these futures markets and so on and so forth feel free Moritz, if you want to plug any names i have dealt with many different firms over my career some are better than others without a doubt how they treat individual investors i have no idea what i do know is that it's not so easy anymore due to compliance to open accounts to get decent terms etc cetera, etc cetera. i will say that it's not necessarily the biggest that are the best i think you get probably better service from some of the smaller names but small doesn't have to mean that you're not experienced because i think the people that Moritz deals with have been around for a very long time yet they're not necessarily one of the biggest of the biggest but it's a very respectable firm so so if we mention names or if Moritz want to share a name or not it's it it may not be something that you can use and it's certainly not one of those platforms where you can just trade on your phone or whatever a lot of these newer fintech type stuff does yeah i don't i don't do that i don't use an app or anything like that for my trading yeah. 
is more like the old fashioned way of, you know, sending orders to a broker. And then that broker takes care of my orders during the day when I don't want to, or I don't have the time to watch the markets. Try stuff out. I think this is, uh, this is what's necessary. You'll probably, if you stay in the game of trading, you'll probably use many brokers over your, over time. Um, I've used many, um, some of them, I liked a lot. Some of them I liked a little less. Um, and you stick with some of you stick with those that you like. Yeah, and I would add to that that some of them, a lot of them, gives you like a seven day or thirty one day free access to their platform. So try out the plat. First of all, I would always look at how long have they been in business. Are there any news, negative news about them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just do your due diligence, do your research. But then on top of that, you might want to just try out some of their online platforms to see what they look like. You ask about charts and whether one chart could be different from another. I have no idea. Yeah, and, that, that and, is that is a good point, Nielsen. Sorry to interrupt there. I didn't mean to do that. No, but fine. Uh, I do not need a platform. So I don't need an, a, a broker that provides me charting services, market data, or any kind of like logging interface where I can see my orders. I get my market data from other sources and I pay for it. And I think, you know, it's no secret we've mentioned before CSI. I think they're providing high quality futures data. I've never had an issue with them at a very fair price. So I separate uh, my market data and all the infrastructure that I have for my trading systems from my broker. My broker is one component of my trading setup. The other component is, you know, Python and Excel and trading blocks and, you know, all these type of things that I run to actually produce the signals that I want to, you know, produce. And so my broker, I sent them orders in a spreadsheet format. You can do that by email. You can give them a telephone call, but I do not log into a online trading platform. And then they report back to me the fills and I get a daily statement, daily trade reports. Of course, they do have like a platform where I can log into like kind of like a back office type of thing where I can see open positions and download statements and stuff like that. But that's about it. And I don't need more. Yeah. And and I completely agree. That's how I also, when I was doing my own stuff before joining Don, that's exactly how I did it. I would also vouch for people like CSI. I've used them for two decades or, or more. And by the way, they do actually have charts. I mean, you, you get the data, but Correct. you can actually also yes. choose to see it as a chart if you want. Because keep in mind, Morris and I really, really only need the open, high, low, close of each market every day. That's all the data we need to run our algo. So, but it's a great point that Morris make that you know you have to maybe separate the two in your mind and how you do your workflow. Even though everyone else is probably trying to get you to integrate everything into an app on your phone, um, but that's not really how we operate because we still need computers to calculate the signals and and all of that good stuff. Final question before we really have to wrap up. If you, I hope you're still with us now. We've been going on for an hour and 22 minutes, so apologize for the long, but this is what happens when Morris and I have been away from each other for three weeks and <laughs> there's so much stuff to talk about. Anyways, Mike writes in, what are your thoughts on managed futures ETFs for smaller investors looking to easily allocate a percentage of capital alongside equity exposure? Let me kick that off. I think in lack of any alternative, I think it's perfectly fine. In Europe, we have usage funds where you can invest as little as $1,000 for those that are authorized for retail investors. Certainly the usage fund that we operate, that is one of those funds, even though you have to kind of do it yourself. We're not allowed to advise retail investors given the current regulation, but, but retail investors can buy it and there are others. ETFs, I think there are fewer I don't think it's a bad alternative, but I don't. I think there are fewer choices there. I can only think of one, but I don't know anything about the strategy or performance or anything like that. Then there in the US, if you're based in the US, Mike, uh, you have, of course, the mutual funds where there are quite a few managed futures mutual funds. And, and of course, the main thing to look at there is the cost. Just be aware it's going to be more expensive than buying, say, an offshore fund. And you need to do a little bit of due diligence to make sure you get the best possible share class for what you're trying to do. You need to be careful with the upfront loads in terms of fees and broker charges and what have you. So really talk to the manager, let them guide you if they're allowed, let them guide you to the best entry point 
into those. But I think it's more the if you're US based investors, it's probably more the mutual funds than it, than the ETFs at this point. But I wouldn't rule out that there will be more ETFs in the future. What I will say, just one thing, and that is, I think a lot of people try to, for a period of time, market lower versions of their trend products through some of these ETFs, etc. And they might even only charge a flat fee, etc., etc. So again, be, do your due diligence to make sure you get the real strategy of the manager, not something that is watered down and sold as a cheap replicator. I'm still of the opinion that you should pay full fees to get the best version of people's products rather than a cheap replicator, but that's just my personal opinion. Anyways, those were my observations. Mortz, anything you want to... Nothing to add there. I think you've summarized it perfectly and I wouldn't have said it any different. All right, good stuff. Now, before we finish, there are a few more points that Moritz and I could have gone on. We have written down as, as talking points, but I do think we want to respect your time and we want you to go, come back next week and they'll be there to to listen. Let me quickly run through and then we'll do what we've started to do, maybe give you a couple of gems to check out. But in terms of performance, it's still an, a good start to the year. So up 1.32% for the Beta 50 index, such and CT index more or less the same, up 1.35%. And the trend index up 2.05%. Sokgen short-term traders index is pretty flat, up 8 basis points so far. MSCI World up 0.92% so far this year. The World Government Bond Index is down 0.61. Just to give you a little bit of feel for that, this is for the CTA side. As of Thursday and Friday was a down day, I'm pretty sure of that. So just be aware of that. Now, Morris, I don't know about you, but do you have any good podcast resources that you've come across this week that you want to share? Well, I only listened, I only managed to listen to one podcast when, when Walking the Dog was uh, Macro Voices with Art Berman. Right. And Art Berman is uh, a geologist, oil, petroleum engineer, something like that, but he knows a lot of stuff about the oil markets. And he looks at oil, obviously, from a very different angle than we do. More like, you know, uh, supply, demand, rig count, that type of stuff. And, you know, I just sometimes find that very interesting to get a different perspective uh, on what's happening in the oil market. So I thought it was a good show. Yeah. My pick was actually one podcast that doesn't come out on a regular schedule. It's actually Jesse Felder. And this week he did put something out. So I pay attention, and that was with actually one of our previous guests, Moritz, that we spoke to in the summer, Daniel DiMartino Booth. I thought it was an interesting update on Central Bank and what we're looking forward to with the change of uh, administration in the U.S., someone returning to the scene, namely Janet Yellen, but this time in the Treasury and not the Fed. So always funny and interesting to listen to Danielle, and of course, Jesse is... Uh, very insightful host. So uh, that was my, that would be my pick for this week. I have nothing further to add except to say that if you enjoyed our conversation, you can help us by going to iTunes and leave a rating and review so more people can discover the podcast. I also want to add that next week I'm joined by Jerry. So if you could send us your questions, in advance, you can do it to info at toptradersonplug.com so that we can get some turtle trading gems from Jerry. Moritz, any final thoughts? No, thank you. We had a lot to talk, a lot to talk about today. Yeah, very much fun and insightful conversation. I certainly learned something about Bitcoin, I have to admit. So from Moritz and me, thanks so much for listening. And we look forward to being back with you next week. In the meantime, be well and stay healthy. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. 
And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.